Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Um, just for our viewers who haven't been following this issue closely, can you explain why climate change is a human rights issue for you? Well, I came to the climate change issue from a human rights perspective. I realised in our work on right to health and decent work and corporate responsibility and women, peace and security in different African countries that they kept raising, ah, but things have changed for the worse. We're being undermined by climate change. And that undermines very important human rights, rights to food, safe water, health, education, shelter. And I realised that we need to make more of a link between the international human rights conventions and covenants and the work of the treaty bodies and the rapporteurs and the UNFCCC process. That process has been led by scientists and environmentalists, understandably, and it needs to be now more human-centred and more holistic. And what do you think the response of the international community has been like so far in terms of its adequacy? Well, I think that the problem is that we are not accepting the common but differentiated responsibilities. The world that benefited from fossil fuel growth is not accepting that there is a need to be much more urgent about mitigating and doing it with an international rules-based system. Uh, we're very supportive of a second period for Kyoto, but also urgent all countries working together on a new climate convention because um, the commitments of individual states are way off course for a safe world. Um, they are not, in fact, bringing us below two degrees Celsius. And the International Energy Agency has told us we have at most five years to get on track um, and we're hearing here that there may not be an agreement before 2020. That's far too late. We cannot have another nine years of waiting because in the meantime the damage will be done. And of course the politicians are arriving this week. Are you expecting fireworks, progress or something else? I just wish they'd have the same sense of urgency that ordinary people on this continent have. I mean, I'm really struck. Um, Constance O'Kellett of Uganda is a good friend of mine, she's a climate wise woman and we've been together in Copenhagen and in Cancun and she has spoken about growing up in her village in Uganda where they were poor but the seasons enabled them to sow and to harvest, they were predictable. Now it's long periods of drought and flash flooding. I met her here, we actually ran into each other in the African uh, pavilion before we were to meet at a, uh, another meeting and I said, well, how are things Constance? And she said, they're terrible. We have flooding at the moment in Uganda during our dry season. We shouldn't have it in November and my ground nuts have been destroyed. And that's her reality and it's the reality for millions on this continent and elsewhere in South Asia. The problem of flooding, the problem of prolonged drought. I was in Somalia in July. That's the worst case scenario. But the reason it's so much worse than when I was there as President of Ireland in 1992 is that the Horn of Africa is having the eight hottest years in succession ever. And that's going to get worse and worse. So we cannot sit back and do a trade negotiation here with everybody, you know, holding their cards to their chest and not giving. We, we must be flexible and get a practical, forward-looking package here in COP17, move on to Rio Plus 20 and get access to energy for the poorest to tackle the impacts of climate change. And we joined over 5,000 activists on the streets on Saturday for the Climate Action Mark. Uh, March. Some of South Africa's leading human rights activists calling for civil disobedience and direct action. Is that something that you think might be uh, effectful? Well, accidentally, I actually was part of that protest myself because I had to get out of here to go to a meeting on uh, food security and climate smart agriculture. And I met a lot of my friends there. And I understand the anger. I fully understand it. That's what the civil society groups should be doing. And I think unless we get real pressure from civil society, not just here at COP17, but in different countries, uh, I hope the Occupy movement will um, link over to talk about climate change because we only have a limited time. And what will future generations think? One of the reasons why our foundation has been bringing together women leaders and we'll have a meeting co-hosted between my foundation and South Africa on Wednesday for women ministers, um, uh, leading figures, including supportive men, to enhance and strengthen the gender dimensions is that there is a, a real gender imbalance in how it impacts, uh, how the climate impacts on women and men. It's not gender neutral. It's actually very unfavorable to women and their families. And at the same time, I think that women instinctively are intergenerational. We think of our children and our grandchildren. I mean, I speak about my four grandchildren who will be in their, 50s in, uh, in their 40s in 2050. And I wonder what kind of world they will have, sharing it with probably about 9.2 billion. I'm less worried 
particularly about my, ch- my grandchildren being Irish, they may not suffer so much. What about the imbalance in the world, the possibility of 200 million climate refugees, which we're, to- we're told about? In other words, I hope that there will be a sense of urgency now that the political figures are coming. That's what we need. That's a thought-provoking uh, point to leave it on, and thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you.